We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program financial journalist and author of The Finance Curse, How Global Finance is Making Us All Poorer. Nicholas Shaxson, welcome to the program. Thanks. Pleasure to talk to you. Um, and, and you did two versions of this book. One is the uh, one is a, a British version. Uh, one is a U.S. version. Uh, the the story is largely the same. Some of the examples are a little bit different. We'll focus on the American ones so that people um, know what uh, you know can have a little bit more sense of like I guess um, of uh, familiarity uh, with these things. But uh, the broader story is this uh, move. Uh, to financialize essentially our economy. Will you just walk us through basically, I guess, from Brenton Woods, uh, which um, from Brenton Woods, which you um, uh, cite as sort of the, um, I guess, the, the sort of the, the, the standard from where we started and then uh, over time we fell. Yes. I mean, historically, there has been... Um uh, there have been periods of kind of conflict between the financial sector and what you might call the mainstream economy, the rest of the economy. Um, the Bretton Woods period after the Second World War was a period when countries came together um, and there was a huge political willingness to do something about the financial sector, which had previously, you know, the, the Great Depression was still in people's minds, which was very substantially caused by um, uh, deregul financial deregulation. They decided to put in place an international cooperative architecture that would effectively crunch the financial sector in many countries right down, restrict it with heavy regulations, um, break up uh, big banks and uh, put in a lot of, um, you know, high tax rates and, you know, very, very progressive policies. And the finance, you know, this was called an era of financial repression when the financial sector was 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 really very heavily restricted and they were furious about it. But that was a period of the highest economic growth um, in world history when all these very progressive policies were in place. Um, before or since, there has never been a, a period of sustained e economic growth around the world in different countries, the United States and elsewhere, um, uh, as that period when finance was very heavily suppressed. Not only that, but uh, the financial sector, when the financial sector was suppressed, you had a very um, growth was very broad based. Um, you know, inequality was falling. Um, there was just, you know, this is the era of the American dream. And there's all sorts of different terms in different um, uh, countries uh, to, to, to talk about this period. Then we had the, the, the 1970s when there was, um, you know, sort of a crisis area, that a crisis era when there was a lot of um, finance moving increasingly quickly around the globe. It was able to escape the constraints of the Bretton Woods, Woods system. And you started getting ideological changes when uh, there was deregulation, financial deregulation. And people said, look, guys, this isn't working. We're going to have to loosen finance and we want more credit in our, our economies. And so they loosened um, regulations and finance, the financial sector from that era really began growing very substantially um, until the global financial crisis. Um, and that period was an era of falling growth um, and uh, also rising inequality. And this kind of speaks to one of the central themes of my book, which is that, um, as I put it um, crudely, too much finance can make you poor. It's kind of a paradox. Um, you know, we all need a financial sector, um, but once it grows beyond a certain size and beyond its useful roles, um, it starts to turn nasty. It starts to have harmful and predatory effects in your economy. And so that's kind of the essence of the of the of the finance curse thesis. OK. And so, I mean, let's I mean, just so that people know, Bretton Woods obviously was a um, uh, a meeting that took place in in New Hampshire. There was, um, I don't know, something near near 50 uh, allied nations there. Um, the, the Soviets uh, attended at the time, but uh, declined to, to ratify the 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 final agreements. What I mean, and, and maybe we can circle back to get a sense of like what, you know, what was happening in parallel uh, as the um, the uh, that that system began to sort of cave. I mean, at the time, I know they uh, the Soviets had said that the institutions they had created were essentially um, uh, tools of Wall Street. And maybe they were they were somewhat dormant um, on some level for a while. But um Let's while we're here, 
When we say finance, will you just give a more explicit definition for folks that so that people can really wrap their minds on this? Because when we, you know, we hear quite a bit the financialization of the economy. I'm not sure that people fully understand what that means. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, I take finance, I look at finance in a very broad form, and I see it kind of like the rings of an onion. So right at the center, you have the, you know, the traditional banks and particularly the big banks. Um, and then outside of that, you have um, more esoteric um, institutions, investment funds and, you know, sh- shadow banking institutions, things that are outside the normal banking regulation, some of them very kind of esoteric. You know, we're talking trillions of dollars here. So that's that's the sort of central part of the financial system. But the other part is what you call um, what you've referred to as financialization. Um, and what that is, is the kind of penetration of finance, of financial tools, of financial institutions, um, financial techniques into other parts of the economy, into agriculture, into manufacturing, into big technology, into tourism, whatever. Um, every other sector of the economy has been subject to um, what you might call financialization. Um, I've recently been in Iowa, and I have a chapter on um, agriculture in yes. Iowa in my book. And you see a whole um, a whole period of time, um, again, sort of starting in the 70s with all sorts of things happening, But you see a real change in, I mean, I looked at the hog farming sector and there's been a tremendous transformation in hogs and in poultry where you used to have large numbers of independent family farms and also large numbers of meat lockers and other kind of, you know, market institutions that allowed a sort of independent competitive market to thrive. And over time, you saw the arrival of um, uh, money, particularly from, you know, Wall Street, Chicago, um, you know, big money center banking started to take over and started to displace the sort of local relationship banking that was the sort of heart and soul of this system. And what you saw then was a period, I mean, there's lots of reasons for why some of the agricultural, the small communities in Iowa and other parts of the Midwest have kind of shrunk. And, you know, if you go to a lot of these small towns, you know, once thriving businesses have um, have shuttered up. I mean, I was walking down um, the high street of Williams, Iowa yesterday and looking at um, all the shops I was being shown, all the shops that used to be open and there's almost nothing left now. And there are various reasons for this. I mean, mechanization and, you know, the rise of, um, you know, tractors and seed technology and things like that have displaced a certain number of workers. But one of the things, and that's kind of seen as progress and unavoidable and, um, you know, just the way things have gone. But I think one of the things that people are missing is that there's also been this financialization element going on. So what you've had is a um, the change from a system where money used to kind of stay much more in the local economy. Um, when you had a system of lots of independent farmers, they would be buying from the local seed merchant, from the local parts supplier. Um, they would be going to the local doctor and the local vet. Um, but what you've had happening since then is um, these small independent farmers have been squeezed out by big agricultural firms, very big agricultural firms, um, with a lot of money from the big money centers financing this change. And what you've seen is, is this, these kind of local circulatory mechanisms where money was sort of staying in the local economy, these have sort of been unrolled and turn more into more of a conveyor belt. So the wealth um, is that used to be circulating locally um, is now kind of being shipped out, shipped outwards to, you know, the big money centers, um, to uh, state capitals, but also internationally, it's going offshore. It's going, you know, two of the biggest firms are um, JBS and Smithfield, which are respectively Brazilian and Chinese. So a lot of this money, this wealth, you know, while you've had mechanization and and technology massively increasing yields, you know, the actual wealth that's been created and coming out of the ground, you have paradoxically been seeing a kind of um, impoverishment of many of these communities. And there's, you know, it's the same paradox, you know, more money coming into the system, but um, many of these communities seem to be poorer than they were. Um, and this, for me, is, is a very significantly a story of financialization. And I think one of, the, you know, one of the hopeful messages of this book and one of the hopeful messages of this particular story of hog farming is that even though you know, the, the rise in technology and the improvement of yields and all that is, is progress, and it's, you know, some jobs have been lost, um, but that's, there is an inevitability about this. This financial side of things, that what I call the finance curse, the, 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 the financialization of the agricultural economy is reversible. 
And you can do that, and you can um, you can break up these big agricultural firms and and you know return competition to these um, these sectors, and you can reduce the use of tax havens and all these kind of tricks and techniques that are being used to, to to extract wealth um, to and 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 create a new kind of economy. Well, I I, I want to circle back on on some of those um, uh, uh, solutions and how we we roll this back um, and. I just, but can you be more, uh, you know, uh, specific in terms of the way that this money is extracted from Iowa? So, uh, for instance, or we can use perhaps we can use. Uh, you, you talk about um, a, a, a New Jersey a newspaper, which has th- this extraction is, you know, and I think maybe that's easier for people to 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 see because. We, we, we have examples of it almost every day, whether it's, you know, sort of uh, local newspapers or we see it in the context of of uh, of of online uh, uh, journalism where uh, wealth is being extracted and um, the localities are being impoverished by this. I mean, what what um, just so that people can see this dynamic, because it's one thing to say, like, OK, well, the money just somehow, you know, is is spent outside of the community. But it, there's more that's going on here. Right. Like these are firms and maybe it's it's uh, the entree into this is through the private equity firms. Um, the money is being extracted and almost the 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 business is almost secondary to extracting all the value out of it. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think private equity is a very good way to illustrate um, what's going on here. Private equity firms, um, their basic business model is to go in and buy up companies, um, again, across the economy from agricultural or newspapers or manufacturing or whatever, um, and to take those companies and then to try and make a profit for their investors. So the private equity um you know, the moguls, the titans, they will get co-investors. Your pension funds, whatever, will come in alongside them. They'll have a huge pot of money and they'll invest, they'll buy up companies. Um, usually, these are perfectly healthy company, uh, um, productive companies with good, strong cash flows. That's what they're generally most interested in. Um, and they buy these companies up. And then what they do is they take those cash flows and they do kind of financial engineering. And the way they do this is they identify all the stakeholders of that company once they've got it, once they've got control of it. And they say, OK, let's look. OK, this, the, one, one stakeholder is, is uh, the, the, the workers. So let's now reduce their benefits. Let's now crush the unions um, and let's now um, get some more money out of workers. So they will, will, they will do that. And in the case of the newspaper I was, um, I was talking to, there was... Uh, um, the, the Trentonian, they, they had been a huge reduction in staffing levels and they had been, um, you know, working conditions were much worse than they used to be. So there was money kind of, you know, there's money kind of taken out of taken out of workers um, and, and new cash flows are generated for them. Then they will go after maybe the pension fund and they'll say, right, there's the, the terms of the pension fund are too generous. Let's, um, you know, take some money out of that. They might go for the, after the company suppliers and, and put more onerous terms on them or pay them late or whatever. Then maybe they might think, okay, we want we we're in a niche here, and we want to monopolise this market niche. So let's buy up a load of companies um, that are that are doing the same sort of stuff, and then we kind of control all or most of them. Once we've got that, we've got market power, and then we can you know we can get more money, we can raise our prices, and um, or we can we can um, reduce wages to workers even further, and and we can get even more money from 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 this stakeholder group. Um, and so there's they they do this kind of. Um, uh, look at all the different stakeholders and they just extract more money. They also will tend to make the company that they've bought take on a huge amount of debt. And this is important that the actual owners, the moguls, the titans, are not the ones who are on the hook for this debt. They um, hang the debt on the shoulders of the company that they've bought. So now you've got a much more indebted company and the proceeds of that borrowing that that company has been made, they now um, funnel it up in special dividends to the actual owners of the company. So the owners of the companies get very rich indeed. Um, in, in many cases, whether or not the underlying company that they bought actually succeeds. So you have a hugely indebted company um, uh, that may fail, it may go bankrupt, but they have already paid this special dividend, this huge special dividend to the to the owners, and the owners may have already made all their money back and then some. Um, by financially engineering these cash flows, um, taking more money out of all the stakeholders, 
um, and paying themselves these huge special dividends. So you end up with a, a fragilized economy, um, but some very rich people indeed. And you know, some of the you know people look at these billionaires and they say, well, this is a sign of economic success. But in many times, in in many cases, in 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 terms of this kind of financialization. It is, it is the flip side of impoverishment, um, impoverishment elsewhere. It is kind of the flip side of economic failure. Um, uh, Toys R Us is a, um, a, a great example of that type of um, leverage buyout and, and then uh, larding up the company with that, everybody walking away and uh, uh, people losing their, their jobs and their pensions and whatever it was. Uh, but, there, but we see this all over uh, the place. Um, and... Um, so okay, with this, so with this private equity model, essentially, where it comes in, extracts all the wealth, does not care about the community or really the future of the business. I mean, at one point, right? It's just like it's many wealth. We see this in hospitals quite a bit around the country, in this country as well, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. I think the healthcare sector is um, there's a huge amount of extraction going on there, and I think a lot of that is um, local monopolization. I think. Yep. You know, private equity firms and others, you know, it's not just private equity firms, but private equity has kind of in many cases spearheaded and designed these financial techniques that are then copied by all sorts of other players. Um, and they will go into the health healthcare sector, sector and they will look at a local market. You know, they may not have a national monopoly on something, but they, they may have a local monopoly on provision of uh, healthcare services. And then once they've got a lock on that market, they have market power and they can just jack up the prices. And alongside that, they will be using all sorts of tax haven strategies and all sorts of other financial techniques using debt and, you know, very complicated financial engineering to juice the returns to the owners of those of those companies. Let's talk about um, uh uh, tax havens and and tax avoidance. I think uh, when most of us here think about that, we think about the Grand Cayman Islands uh, or some such place. Um, but you also talk about South Dakota. Well, yes, indeed. Um, one of the things I, I actually wrote a book about tra tax havens about ten years ago called Treasure Islands, where I looked at the whole offshore system. And one of the great revelations for me as I was looking into this was that tax havens are not where we think they are. Um, one of the biggest and arguably the biggest player in the whole system of offshore tax havens is the United Kingdom, Britain, my country, um, where you have um, the City of London Financial Centre surrounded by a kind of network of satellite tax havens um, from the Cayman Islands to the British Virgin Islands to Bermuda to Jersey, a whole lot of others. Um, but also there are all sorts of little ne the whole offshore system of tax havens is like an ecosystem with lots of different niches and lots of different players all over the place providing different services so south dakota was very interesting um if you go to sioux falls um there's a kind of main street where there's a few of these um basically wealth management companies and they are um offering services to billionaires and very wealthy people um, to help them escape paying taxes. And they've got all sorts of tricks um, to, um, you know, to, to, they use trusts and, and many other mechanisms um, to help them help them escape paying taxes and also escape other rules and regulations that, that they may, may not like. And for me, you know, Sioux Falls illustrated one of the, you know, again, one of the great themes of the finance curse, this, this idea that, you know, um, the money that all these trillions that you see these billionaires and all this money that seems to be circulating in these places doesn't seem to actually be trickling down to the ordinary people who work in these places. So if you go to Sioux Falls, um, you know, the main street where all that money is, there's nothing very impressive there. You know, you'd think with all this billionaire wealth um, circulating on paper through these places that there would be a lot more kind of trickle down, a lot more wealth generated locally. But in fact, you know, it's just a couple of hundred jobs really that have been created um, at the expense of much, much larger losses to ta to U.S. taxpayers um, elsewhere. What, what are the circumstances that Sioux Falls becomes, uh, that South Dakota becomes this magnet, as opposed to, say, I don't know, New York State or New Jersey? Well, South Dakota has um, got a, a zero percent tax rate for certain for certain aspects um, of uh, you know the way you structure your structure your financial affairs, um, and. It is also the other thing about South Dakota is that it is a very small state. And um, this is kind of in parallel to other tax havens. Um, a lot of the most important tax havens in the world, like the Cayman Islands, are very small states. And the main reason for this is that 
big finance, big global mobile finance is able to influence the legislatures of these places, able to influence lawmakers much more easily in a very small state where you can kind of, you know, somewhere like Bermuda with just 50,000 people, but, you know, some of the biggest um, companies in the world and many billionaires coming there, they can have enormous influence. You know, they come into these little places and often the lawmakers you know, don't have particular expertise in finance. And you have these accountants and lawyers coming in with incredibly complicated um, legislation saying, look, you need to approve this and, you know, you'll make a lot of money. And and so it, generally, it's quite easy to influence the legisl- legislatures of these places um, to change the laws, to create, you know, for example, a, a secrecy law. And, if, you know, of course, the, the South Dakota has some very powerful secrecy laws that if you incorporate in that state, you know, you will, you'll be able to uh, cast a veil over your financial affairs. That's another big, big aspect of it. But, but I think this, this idea of what you know, kind of the, the political capture of the state of, of of the state is very strong in these in these small places. It'd be much more difficult in a place like New York because you have all these democratic constituencies to 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 to, to go up against. Whereas in these small places, you can you can just get what you want if you're you know big finance. I, I wish I could uh, take your response and frame it on the wall for every uh, debate I have with so-called libertarian, is really sort of neo-Confederates, uh, as to why bigger actually uh, can be better uh, in that regard. Uh, I've tried to make people understand that dynamic of um, smaller entities can be much e- more easily bought by much bigger, wealthier entities. Um, it just becomes, you know, sort of uh, cat's play for them. Um, yeah, exactly. That- and, and there's another thing, there's another aspect of this is that, is that um, states kind of uh, compete with each other. You know, one state puts, it, puts in place a very clever secrecy law, and another state will look at that and say, hey, we can do something even cleverer and more devious than that. So they put something in, and then the first state or other states join in and put in something even worse. So you kind of get this race to the bottom, this spiral to the bottom of, um, you know, deeper secrecy and more relaxed regulation and stuff like this. It's going on all the time among U.S. states, but it's also going on international, internationally between between countries. Um, you, you also at least allude to the to the um, to the problem of, of of fake news. And when we talk about this uh, regime that th- this regime of financialization that has taken over where. Um, you know, you have uh, holding companies or private equity owning um, hospitals and uh, nurses shifts hours and how long they have to work is being dictated by people who simply want to extract more wealth out of these hospitals. And so they're developing, you know, uh, uh, procedures, essentially, uh, based upon how much uh, how much more money they can take out of these uh, hospitals or, or, you know, or whatever it is. Um As an example, but this exists or they've been able to do this or they've been aided by the fake news of that you say comes from the economics profession. Uh, Do tell. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's various flavors of fake news. I mean, there's the stuff we all all know about um, that is just kind of, you know, lies and all that stuff that we see on our airwaves all the time. But when I'm talking, you know, I spend a bit of time talking about the, the, the fake news that um, comes out of the financial sector, which is really, it has so much influence over our cultures, our media, our political system that you get a kind of consensus um, uh, happening. And again, I would, you know, take the private equity example again. Um, one of the Probably the biggest um, tool in the private equity t- toolbox for making money is what I call other people, what's known as other people's money, OPM. Um, and what happens is you get the moguls coming in and they um, attract other co-investors to you know, put their money with them and then they invest them and they take huge fees out of And the fees depend on how much OPM, how many billions they've got to, to, to people to come and co-invest alongside them. So to attract this OPM, this other people's money, you need to basically, you need to get involved in storytelling, telling, you know, why I'm the greatest, why you must invest, invest with us and why it's important to um, give, you know, give me your money. And, And so much of the financial sector has become about storytelling, about trying to say that we need, you know, we need these things, we'll have more billions, you know, you, just this simple idea that, you know, all these billionaires are rich, therefore, you're going to get rich as well. You know, there's this kind of idea of trickle down. And, 
you know, they do need to tell these stories. So they invest huge amounts of money in um, in think tanks, in universities, in uh, just generally trying to ch- change people's minds about about what's important and trying to put a financial view out there. And often you get, you know, when, when a political event happens, um, I see it a lot in my own country and, and it, it also happens a lot here. Um, when something happens, you know, they, the, the media will call up an analyst, but they won't call up, you know, if you have a, a plane crash or something, you know, the 737 crash, you know, very often they won't call up an engineer. They'll call up someone from Wall Street or the city of London to, uh, to analyze this. And, and very often, you know, these players are kind of the, um, the part of the problem. Um, they are the ones who are calling for money to be taken out of these companies to, you know, which results in, you know, a loss of investment. And in the case of, you know, uh, uh, the 737, for example, yep. there's there's a strong case for saying that, that um, you know, safety standards were reduced because so much money had to be paid as dividends to shareholders in Wall Street. Um, so you get all these... You, all these... Uh, you, you, you cite Bill Lozanek, uh, who's been a guest exactly. uh, multiple times on this uh, show, who uh, recently wrote a piece about that very um, uh, issue with the 737 that um, the, the the company had the opportunity, I don't know if it was a, a decade or two ago, to uh, make some structural changes to the planes that were a function of uh, changes in U.S. airports. Uh, they decided rather than to overhaul their planes, uh, they cut some corners and uh, they figured they could do a software patch, essentially, uh, to deal with with this um, this slight redesign of their plane, and uh, we saw what happened. Exactly, yes. And Bill Lazonic, um, as much as anybody, has done fantastic research. And his, you know, his big thing is shareholder value. This idea that what matters is wealth coming out for the owners, you know, for the shareholders. Um, and this is all about extracting wealth. Um, you know, I in the book I make this great contrast between wealth extraction and wealth creation. You know, wealth creation is the stuff we need in our economy. This is, you know, productive things being done, creating new widgets and services and all sorts. Um, but then the extractors come along and they they start sucking the wealth out of, 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 you know, out of businesses and so on. And this has not only economic dimensions, it not only reduce, you know, does things like reduce overall economic growth and, and increase inequality, but it has very powerful geographical effects because the extraction often happens from um, poorer parts of the country and um, uh, is channeled to the richer parts of the country, um, but also it has um, racial dimensions. You know, the people, the most vulnerable, vulnerable people tend to be um, the ones extracted from it has gender dimensions, you know, any kind of um, uh, uh, dimension of, of, you know, discrimination and inequality and, and so on, um, you will find that the finance curse worsens um, these dimensions in very hidden ways, often ways you don't, you know, they're, they're very complicated to understand um, in, in their details. But I think ultimately it's a pretty simple concept. It's just, you know, money is being extracted from these um, these these communities, these areas, these these um, you know groups of people, and channeled to a relatively small group of you know mostly middle-aged white men in in the big money centers. And uh, in in your conclusion, I mean, you, you you lay out some just sort of broad principles. I think that we could follow to to at, at the very least um, fix this uh, ill of of financialization. Uh, which essentially, you know, are, are in many ways just reimposing uh, reforms that we had prior to, I don't know, the early 70s and, and through the 80s. I mean, things like stock buybacks, they were once illegal. <laughs> they could be illegal again. Um, a, a, a perspective on antitrust that looks at all of the implications of uh, monopolization rather than just how cheap it is for people in the short run. Uh, what else uh, is is key in your mind? Yeah, no, I think those are all very important. I think, you know, ultimately the most important thing is a, is a reframing exercise. And I think that is definitely going on in the United States and the United Kingdom and other places. Um, there, there has been this idea of, you know, the billionaires and the, the large multinationals as the wealth creators. 
Um, but if we can start reframing them very significantly as the wealth extractors, um, you know, these are the people who, you know, one of the big secrets of the wealthiest people in this country is they don't like free markets. What they like is rigged markets. And I think people are increasingly able to see this. And once we can move away from the idea that we need to sort of support these rich people as the wealth creators and um, look at the wealth extraction strategies that they that they are involved in, monopolization and the use of tax havens and um, all these things that they're doing, we can we can actually start seeing that there's a whole load of democratic possibilities that become open to us, that we can start raising tax rates on wealthier people we can and, and on multinationals. We can start putting in, in place strong antitrust and things like that. Um, and not only will that reduce inequality and redistribute money towards um, and income um, and power towards, you know, the middle classes and ordinary people, but it will also um, increase overall economic growth and prosperity. It's kind of a win-win. And I think people at the moment are a bit hamstrung by the idea that if we you know, tax the billionaires and do it too much, we'll, we'll damage economic growth. Um, but, but once we realize that we can, do, we, we, we can um, you know, bring back democracy, we can have both um, redistribution and, and you know, reduced inequality, but also higher economic growth and higher prosperity. There's really nothing to stop us. Nicholas Shaxon, The Finance Curse, How Global Finance is Making Us All Poor. We'll put a link at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. really appreciate it. Great to talk to you. Thanks. Bye-bye.